Hello, and welcome to the fifth presentation of Avalanche Canada's webinar series. First, we'd like to thank our sponsors. We're very thankful for our sponsors and their financial support for us during this challenging economic climate and working with us to reach new backcountry users this winter. There's a lot of them. The Columbia Basin Trust is our main sponsor for this event and special thanks to RMR who has been hosting Staying Alive events for almost every year since the resort opened. We have our premier sponsors, our contributors, and our local businesses and partners. Really important to shop local this year. Keep those dollars in ready and in your local communities. We also want to bring your attention to Revelstoke's ambassador program. Check the chat box for a link if you'd like to apply to this program. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everybody is muted automatically in the GoTo software. Uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions we're gonna after a couple of our speakers so to do so you can either uh, click the raise hand icon in the GoTo dashboard uh, or you can uh, ask a question in the question chat box also in the GoTo dashboard today's presentation uh, we're going to uh, tonight we're going to share some really imp important messages messages from various organizations in town including Revelstoke Mountain Resort Avalanche Canada Parks Canada Revelstoke Search and Rescue, and the Revelstoke Snowmobile Club. All of these messages combined help you to make good decisions this winter while you recreate in our beautiful backcountry. Many of you have moved here to enjoy the deep pow. Use this evening's event as a start starting point on your journey to learn more about staying safe and staying alive this winter. Marty Schaefer, owner and guide of Kapow, uh, of Kapow and uh, Grant Helgeson, senior avalanche forecaster at Avalanche Canada, will be starting the evening off. Then we'll be hearing from Avalanche Ambassadors Nadine Overwater and Chris Rubens with their tips on staying safe in the backcountry this season. We also have Nancy Geismar on the line ready to give away some sweet prizes. So I'm going to pass it along to Marty without any further ado. Enjoy the presentation. Awesome. It's so cool. Like being able to see um, everyone tuning in here. It's like over 300 attendees. It's kind of funny. I feel like most everyone's from Revelstoke too. Are we like within a kilometer radius? You guys, this is really cool. I've been a part of this event for a while and I actually went to one when I was 16 years old. Um, really psyched that RMR has been um, partnering with this event. But you know what would be cool? Before I dive into it a whole lot, there's this cool poll feature and it would kind of give us an idea of who's all tuning in. Um, so I think Colin, you can pop that up. We want you guys, can you dive on in and then just get engaged and let us know um, why you're in Revelstoke this winter. I came to Revy, um, you can pop that on as I'm chatting here. I came to Revy in my early 20s. Actually, Chris Rubens was the one that brought me here. He was living here the year before the ski hill started. I was pretty psyched. I got a job in the, a ski patrol at RMR. It was like a dream come true. And then eventually I got my ACMG cert and then started this guiding company, Kapow Guiding, based here in Revelstoke, which is kind of like, we kind of specialize in backcountry and avalanche mentorship as certified ECG guides, running many AST1 and AST2 courses, and then runner operations out of uh, Rogers Pass, and also the backcountry ski touring lodge that I grew up at, Blanket Glacier Chalet. It's a heli flight out of here. As you guys are rolling through that, I just want you to all know how important this event is to all us athletes, guides, senior forecasters, knowing that we've all been there before. Not only tonight is about sweet presentations and prizes, this really is our opportunity to set you guys up for success for ski touring in Revelstoke. This place is intimidating. This place is legit. Um, you'll see in our Instagram feeds, even you know, my job is to make this stuff look super fun, obviously, well, kind of effortless, but this is kind of letting you guys know there's so much more that goes into it than that sweet Instagram post or a day of ski touring. Um, I think this is the reality too, and I was saying it before, but uh, we've all been there before. Uh, oh, this is super cool. So this is the poll. This is uh, this is it. So we've got two percent of the people that have a job at RMR. Uh, I have a job elsewhere in the community. Is nineteen percent, but the winning is I don't have a job here, but I'm here to shred the pow. <laughs> well, you guys, psyched you're here. Um, obviously for the snow as well. And first winter at Revelstoke, thirteen percent. It's a pretty sweet demographic. Um, I was just saying, you know, we've all been there before. Um, I've had so many conversations with Rubens about this, but, uh, you know, we used to come to these events. We used to look up to the people presenting, so it's pretty cool for us to give back. Um, 
So you guys tonight, I, you know what, actually let's do another poll. This would be kind of cool. Um, there's a variety of different um, education levels out there. And I think the next poll, Colin, it'd be cool to pop on up, um, is sort of like what sort of avalanche training you guys have from none, mm -hmm. a little, maybe a couple of these webinars to AST1, AST2, or maybe something professional in there. Um, so myself, when I came to Revy, I had the professional level, CAA level two, um, I think Rubens, you have like an operations level one. Uh, you've taken the, I think it was called rec courses back in the day. Um, so you, just so you guys clearly understand the difference there, there's the recreational level and that's where Avalanche Canada dives into the AST ones, AST twos. And then once you work in the industry, that's the Canadian Avalanche Association. So it's different, it's kind of the same, they're cousins, but the professional side is a little bit different. So I'm super curious to know what level of Avalanche training you guys have, if any. Yeah, it's coming in pretty pretty hot here. We've got 86% of people have voted. Uh, everybody should know it's uh, it's an anonymous poll, so we're not going to hunt you down and market out. <laughs> we've got your data, so now we're going to like target you guys. <laughs> we're just kidding. This is an open format. You guys, you have no idea how cool it is that Avalanche Canada has things like this. Put these events on. Okay, sweet. So 12%, no training. We have 23%, some webinars, seminars, workshops, that sort of thing. This is cool and this is interesting. I thought this was gonna be the case. 45% of you guys have your ST1. 12% have AST2 and then 8% have professional level training. I have a feeling that 8% of those people are people that I know personally are gonna make fun of me. <laughs> and now that 45% of the AST ones, you're gonna make fun of me by the end of the night. You know what's really cool with this? Do you guys to sum it all up? AST1 is kind of the way that, it's kind of like a community thing. It's sort of your entry level into the backcountry. It sets the foundation of communications, understanding, um, best terrain practices, avalanche terrain knowledge, um, and even rescue. So we're obviously preaching taking that AST1 is the start. It's the best way to start. We believe, especially in Revelstoke, where this place is so dang complex, take that AST1. How it works is Avalanche Canada doesn't put these on. It's the individual operators that do. So Revelstoke Mountain Resort, they've got a ton. Check them out from the rock, AST1s and AST2s. There's other operators like myself uh, that teach the ski specific side. So we do tons of AST1s, tons of AST2s, and some really cool snow, snowmobile specific ones. Check out Nadine's business. She'll get into a little bit more, but this is like the best place on earth to take an Avalanche course. Um, Guys, I'm going to dive dive into sort of this next piece here, and really where this comes from is um, RMR has put this. Uh, I'm going to screen two here. RMR has been a supporter of this event for years because the reality is, is there's been tons of rescues. There's been too many people that have been seriously injured or even lost their lives off the ski, including staff. So as you can imagine, as I was saying earlier, this is our opportunity to dive in, pull up, put our heart into this and really set you guys up for success on this winter. But massive props to RMR. They're busting their butts off right now to get the season started and um, really psyched to talk about the avalanche conditions up there. Oops. So I'm um, <laughs> gonna, hit you, gonna hit you with some stats. Before that there was a ski hill and things were avalanche controlled, this place was avalanche ranch. As you guys know, a, a stat, I don't even know if they're advertising this anymore, but RMR has the longest vertical in North America. And as you can see those numbers there in terms of the size, but look at the amount of percent for advanced and inter intermediate terrain. The reality is there is a lot of avalanche terrain and there is a lot of uh, advanced terrain off the ski hill. Tons of snow. I don't need to tell you guys this. This is the reason why you're all here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about like what's going on inbounds. So inbounds, ski patrollers working their butts off to mark everything, give you guys a heads up. I don't need to tell you what these signs are. You all drive a vehicle. You all had to get here. But what I'm getting at here is there's a lot of hazards that are marked inbounds that are setting you guys up for success. Obviously, being in inbounds, uh, ski patrollers' jobs are just to mark as many things as you can. I've been there before. We can't mark everything, but that's part of the job is to kind of give you guys a uh, heads up what's going on on the mountain. But this is really what you're coming here for, talking about avalanche conditions. So the reality, you guys, is things are quite controlled in bounds. You know, you've heard the bombs go off. You've, you've, you've heard about all the control that happens. As soon as you leave the area boundary, you're on your own. So the way it's laid out in the ski hill, 
it's, it's pretty much roped off above 1400 meters. Everything below that, you'll see the ski area boundary mark kind of on trees and stuff like that. So it's pretty self-explanatory, but I really want to make it clear that when you leave that boundary, you're on your own. So this is the operational boundary. And what's interesting at RMR compared to anywhere else I've been for ski resorts is the mountain is kind of like this big cone. So if as soon as you leave the boundary, in some spots, even if you take two turns, you have to traverse so hard to get back. The ski hill boundary was set up really well operationally for, for skiing and bounds. But as soon as you exit the boundary, it's really quite complicated and hard to get back. And I'm saying this based on experience. I think the first year I worked on patrol, I think it was like 21 heli evacuation. Um, literally, someone would spend the night, couldn't get back on their own, call for help, and they had to get heli lifted out of there. And that sucks. That's a big deal, spending the night and having to evac. As you can see on this here, there's, there's, some, there's two sort of common spots that people exit the boundary. And obviously that's identified here on the stars. Super easy, you guys. You get off the stoke chair, within less than five minutes, you can be in the boundary. And this is the hard thing is there's tracks out there. You duck the rope and it looks like it's the same thing as inside the boundary. But I can tell you that it's not. And that's the way it's managed. It's managed very differently. So if we kind of put like an overlay of what the avalanche terrain looks like, um, the yellow represents, um, you know, common avalanche terrain inbounds. And then the red area here identifies uh, avalanche terrain outside the boundary. And I, I think there's a little slide here later, but I can tell you based on um, working on avalanche control here is even though you might hear explosives go in the, you know, adjacent area, we are not, the ski patrol is not, uh, they're not mitigating the hazard outside the boundary. They're doing it specifically in the boundary. And there's also a lot that happens within. It's not like a complete mitigation that there's no avalanche hazard. So the way this is identified is you've probably seen those close signs from earlier and you guys recognize that from any resort you've been to, but I really wanna talk about the difference between closed and open, um, those open signs. I'm sure you guys have even seen this even on the mountain. So closed avalanche danger, it's not just like your regular closure that you see in the lower mountain where there's like a snow pad or something. If you poach this, both would, would usually mean you're getting your pass pulled. But closed avalanche danger, if the mountain's open, there's a good chance there's explosives going off. <laughs> That's a different level of like, get yourself into trouble. So when you see that closed, there's no negotiation here. Just don't go. This is not like sweet pow. This is means that you could get blown up or get caught in a legit avalanche. When it's time to open that up, Ski Patrol is gonna flip the sign and say caution avalanche area. Just to be clear, there's still a chance you can get some moving snow in this. This isn't complete mitigation of avalanches. <clears throat> there's also something called a permanent closure. There's only one spot on the ski hill where this happens. <clears throat> it's both because we think that, the, where RMR thinks that the ski terrain is too gnarly to ski, but more than that, there's also a, a huge cliff. But if you trigger even a small avalanche in this, uh, this permanent closure, there could be enough snow, <clears throat> sorry, that builds up and picks up on the track below. They just like, there could be like, a, there's a green run, there could be a five-year-old kid shredding down and someone entering in here could have enough impact to bury someone in bounds. So we're super thankful that the ski patrol mitigates the hazard here so that we can ski without our avalanche gear. It's incredible. Just gonna take a quick sip here. It's pretty cool to see the um, see things from the ski patroller side. These guys start super early. Avalanche uh, forecaster shows up at 6 a.m. every day, goes through, you know, is it today's the day to do avalanche control, morning meeting being which runs are open, which are closed. Um, the ski patrollers even check every run to make sure there's um, no hazards that need to be mitigated. And then there's hours go by before the first gondola opens up at 6.30, I'm sorry, at, at 8.30. So often we started our day in, in headlamps. So you guys, you've heard this from town. Um, most of the avalanche control happens in North Pole. That's just kind of where the, the bigger terrain is and that's kind of where the loading and stuff happens. So with forecaster kind of shows up and decides whether or not we need to use avalanche control um, with explosives. So what's kind of cool with explosives is the idea is instead of um, putting a ski patroller on the slope with a ski cut, the explosive can mitigate that hazard without having to put in the exposure. So a lot of explosives are used because, well, we get tons of snow here, we get tons of wind. 
Um, just, a reminder, just a reminder, the four weather inputs that affect avalanche change, precip, temps, winds, and solar. Well, I can tell you we get a ton of those off the ski hill. And then once, um, well, part of opening the mountain, not, it's not just avalanche control, you're placing signs, you're marking hazards, and you're checking the boundary markings. So to be honest, you guys, the amount of rope and signage there is in the mountain is nuts for how much, like how many ski patrollers are. It's a huge job to start it up. It's kind of your responsibility to have an idea where inbounds and out of bounds is. I really want to hit on the fact that it's like, when you leave the boundary, you're very much off the boundary. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But just how the, this big mountain works is at 2.30 in the afternoon, the ski patrol has to start shutting things down because it's so big. Sweep starts at the top of the mountain, goes down to the uh, ripper chair, and then eventually starts closing things down to have everything down at 4.30. So the idea is every run gets swept. You can, If you're spending the night or you're caught in a tree or something like that, ski patrollers are trying to find you, but they're also trying to close the mountain so that um, cats and snow cats can kind of hit the mountain and start grooming. And keep that in mind if you are going out of bounds and coming back in. If you're coming back in around 2.30 or 3, it's kind of heads up hockey if you're coming down the mountain. It's, it's RMR is going to say it's preferred that you're going down the mountain before um, the snow cats hit 2.30, 3 o'clock. And that's what I'm hitting on here. This is a real hazard. Obviously, you guys, you're not going to see it coming down at night. There's a big witch cat, a uh, big uh, cable going down the middle of the run. Obviously, nobody wants you to be skiing down if there's a witch cat happening. If you see this stuff, just get the heck out of there. So here's the deal. Inbounds, things are mitigated. And we're, we've all started our ski career skiing inbounds. And we've, we've developed, um, you know, we, we learned terrain skiing inbounds. But as soon as you cross that boundary line, and we've seen it, actually, there's even photos of, of out in Southside where it's like inbounds have been mitigated. And literally out of bounds, there's a large size two avalanche. So even if you've heard from your friends that the ski patrollers were out of bounds checking things out and it's okay, and even if you've seen tracks going out there, I'm telling you guys right now that, that it's not been controlled. So regardless of the amount of tracks, regardless if there's been ski patrol out there, you're on your own. So the first question, you're leaving the boundary. Does your group have the skills? So we've talked about the AST1. Sure, it's great to practice with your roommate that's been there and done it before but there's nothing comparable to a professional teaching avalanche course. All right, here's the other one. Are you guys carrying a transceiver shovel and probe? I mean, there is like no negotiation here. If you are leaving the boundary, you're bringing those three things. I'm gonna add on there a way, let's get, it talks a little bit later here, but like a way to contact help. So that's a cell phone, a spot, a radio, that sort of thing. And also can you self rescue? So. If you're gonna leave the boundary, I'm telling you that I could not believe it the first year that we were open at uh, the ski hill. So many people said the night. So if you're gonna leave, you're gonna self-rescue, do you wanna get out? Do you wanna spend the night? Do you have a backpack? I mean, at this point, if you guys see someone ski touring it out of bounds and they're not wearing a backpack, I'm gonna give you personal permission to shame them. <laughs> All right, do you have emergency contact abilities? Hit on that earlier. Have you checked the bulletin? I'm so psyched that Grant is talking tonight. What we have as a resource in our Avalanche Canada bulletins is amazing. I don't want you guys just to check the hazard rating. I want you to dive into the Avalanche problems. And if that stuff doesn't make sense, AST1, AST2. Check the forecast and um, do you have a plan to come and go? I'm telling you, lots of people have spent the night out. It's, it's a mountain that's not marked outside the ski area boundary, even though it looks like it's in bounds. So you guys, even if it's out of bounds. Here's a really cool photo. You can see the boundary line there. This is off uh, really side. And this is a classic thing. I mean, I've been guilty of it too, where you go underneath the rope and there's everyone traversing underneath because there's some fresh pow, like a three kilometers at the end of the traverse track. But as soon as it's out of bounds, even though ski patrollers have done avalanche control because they're worried about things coming down to hit the way lower down, I'm telling you, you're on your own out there. So a couple of things to keep in mind when you are out of bounds, you know, technically that is not the ski patrollers arena. If you get yourself caught out there, search and rescue is 911. If you're going to be skiing inbounds, you know, even out of bounds, I'd throw in that ski patrol emergency number, sorry, on your phone. So you guys, the ski hill has been working really hard to get things open for us. Um, it's kind of like one of those things where remember that it's a privilege to be off RMR. 
And um, they kind of reserve the right if you're acting ridiculous, you're not adhering to the Alpine Responsibility Code, they can refuse you. So it's a privilege. We're so lucky to have like the best ski resort in the world. It is not comparable to Whistler. Don't let anyone tell you that. <laughs> um, so really psyched. Thanks for all the hard work for our Mar patrollers and Rebel Stoke Mountain Resort. I want to just quickly add at the end here, if you guys run into a dog, super cute, I know it's super cute dog on the mountain. I want to let you know these are avalanche dogs. If you see that Carta, that, that specific vest, um, keep your hands off them. This is not a playful dog. This is a dog that's there for work. As you can imagine, if someone ever gets caught in an avalanche, this is a great resource for us. Um, if, you know, if someone's not wearing an avalanche trend seat or buried an avalanche, a dog is like the best case. So I'm just telling you guys, hands off, this is working. Do not distract those dogs. Sweet. Well, in an attempt to stoke you guys out, keep the energy alive, we've got some prize giveaways here. So Nancy's coming up. She's got one day pass for RMR. Even though you have, some of you guys probably have a season's pass. Nancy, I'm hoping you could like, dig into your hat of tricks, or I don't know how you're going to pick the uh, almost 400 people that are signed in for this. <laughs> Thanks, how about a day pass Marty. At RMR? I've got a random draw here, and the winner for a day pass at RMR is Patty Shaw. So Patty Shaw, you can contact us at producer at avalanche.ca, and we'll set you up with your prize. Thanks. Awesome, Patty. All right, you guys, next, I am so psyched to introduce a very good friend of mine, a longtime ski touring partner and friend. Grant Helgeson was one of the youngest avalanche professionals in the U.S. He's moved himself up to Canada. He is a senior avalanche forecaster and probably the best communicator of avalanche knowledge I have ever met. He shreds on skis and a snowmobile. And you guys have no idea how lucky we are to have a guy like Grant as a senior avalanche forecaster. Grant, I want you to hit it. Hit us with some knowledge. Oh, that's fun. Thanks, Marty. Wow, almost making me blush here. I have so much love and respect for you and everything you've created that to get an introduction like that from someone that's such a good friend is just so meaningful. Thanks so much. That's what the backcountry is all about is forging these incredible relationships and shared experiences. Avalanche Canada, we are your one-stop shop for all things mountain weather, snowpack, avalanche information. We've got it going on. So. No matter how you're traveling out there in the backcountry, whether you're sledding, snowshoeing, ice climbing, ski touring, split boarding, no boarding, sledding, it just goes on and on. Um, we're all out there for one thing. We all have, to have a good time, get some good shredding in, have good times with buddies, and then get home safe. And that's what Avalanche Canada here is to, and we're here to help you do, is to get that great information, make good decisions, and get home safe. So we do that with our flagship product, obviously the avalanche forecast. We're gonna get into all these things. Then we have a mountain weather forecast, which is hands down the best weather resource that you can get your hands on for all things mountain weather. Uh, we have a, a variety of educational resources. Marty's talked about AST courses. We have Abby Savvy. We're gonna talk about all this kind of stuff. We have the forecaster blog, which is a, a known and loved entity on the website. Trip planner to help you match the train to the current conditions. The Mountain Information Network, or MIN, as we commonly refer to it, and then the mobile app. So, Avalanche Forecast. This is the first thing you see when you visit us at avalanche.ca, and you see all of our forecasts displayed on the map. You also see all the little uh, weather stations. You can go out there and get real-time snow information. So, how much did it snow? How windy is it? What temperature is it? Um, we host all that for you guys as well. And what you need to do, if you're going to be looking at the Avalanche Forecast, is figure out where you want to go. Now in Revelstoke, we're pretty fortunate because we have access to a lot of different areas. If you're gonna, let's say you're gonna go to the gorge, uh, I might go out towards Malacqua, you're gonna be looking at the North Columbia forecast, or maybe you're gonna start ski touring down south as you head anywhere between here, the ferry down to Halfway Hot Springs. That's where you're gonna be checking out the South Columbia forecast. And then in the middle, of course, is the world famous Rogers Pass or Glacier National Park. They have their own forecast up there too, written by their forecasters. So you gotta click on that icon, on that region, and it brings you some information. Right away, you see when the forecast was prepared, when it's valid until, who wrote it, and then that, that headline. And that's just the bottom line. That's the one thing that we want you to remember if you're heading out there into the backcountry. So we put a lot of time into crafting that. At this time, it was a week of heavy snowfall has left the snowpack prime for large human-triggered avalanches. Well, wow, that's gonna make me wanna read a bit more about this and get into the more details of this forecast. 
and you can do that as you move forward. We have things like danger ratings. So we actually give each what we call vegetative band or elevation a danger rating. And you know, it's pretty easy when it's high, it means that it's like a, a red stoplight. It's just don't go, natural avalanches are happening. When it's low, green essentially means go, but it's those in-between places, the moderate and considerable that can be really tricky to manage. And as soon as you start seeing that yellow and orange in there, you gotta start paying attention big time. So we'll actually rate the vegetation or rate the elevation and its danger rating for all three bands for the next three days. So you can actually see a trend about if, if the danger is going up or down or staying somewhere in between. Now we get into the things like avalanche problems. That's the next thing that comes down as you scroll down from the danger ratings. And that is the who, what, when, where, size, and likelihood. This is essentially what kind of avalanche problem are you going to be out there tackling? So we have things like what elevations does it live at here? Is it only in the Alpine? Or is sometimes we have avalanche problems like surface war that tend to be worst at treeline and below treeline. We have which slopes is it on? So that's which direction does the slope face, or as we call it, aspect. Then we have the chance of avalanche, everything from unlikely to certain, that little dial there, and the expected size. So obviously a size two enough to bury, injure, or kill a skier, size three getting a little bit bigger, all the way to size four and five, that is enough to, uh, it's a biblical avalanche enough to destroy a village, but you can kind of see the, the general size trend of the avalanche there, so you know what you're dealing with out there. But it's not just avalanche forecast that we work with. Let me back up for a second. We also have train and travel advice. So for every avalanche problem out there, there's this friendly neighborly advice. And as a forecaster, this is me telling you what I think the key points are for you to think about out there with your day. So now this is that same avalanche forecast. We had a widespread buried weak layer down about a meter and has the potential to produce large avalanches that will likely take some time to heal. Hmm. We're looking at possible to likely size two to three avalanches. So that's probably gonna mean that I'm gonna be staying pretty conservative with my skiing that day. So there you go. The train and travel advice is just that, that friendly neighborly advice. So use conservative route selection, choose moderately angled and supported terrain with low consequence. So you can take things like this and actually apply them to where you wanna go for the day. Remote triggering, triggering is a concern, watch out for adjacent slopes. That's a big watch out because now we're not just triggering avalanches when we enter the slope, they might be spidering around train features or connecting adjacent bowls, spooky times. And it's a time to minimize exposure to steep sun exposed slopes when the solar radiation is strong. Marty touched on the, the various aspects that um, have an impart on hazard. And so when the sun comes out, things can change in a hurry. So we do this for each avalanche problem. And we have a, another detail section where we get into recent avalanche activity, the snowpack summary. So we, we provide a ton of information to Avalanche Canada just in our avalanche forecast. It's not just avalanche forecast at Avalanche Canada though, it's also mountain weather forecasts. So you know, when you're looking around, how do we get our weather? Well, you can get the icons from the Environment Canada, the, the town forecast. There's a high elevation forecast they produce for when you're traveling um, through the highways. And then we have things like spot weather, of course, um, which is one of my favorites. But you have to get the big picture first. You actually have to understand what's happening in the weather picture across the province to then be able to use one of those features like spot weather. And the reason being is because spot weather is just a little pinpoint and it's, a, it's an export of a model of, of, of weather. So it's a computer model spitting weather out. And we all think that spot weather is really slick. But if you don't understand the general trend, you might just get sucked into a, a false confidence that you know what's going on. But then if you start clicking through all the different pieces, like for Revelstoke, for instance, you can click on nine or 10 different weather models of spot weather. You can get sucked into one of those. They're going to say drastically different things. So how do you how do you tell which one's right, which one's wrong, or which one's probably somewhere in between and maybe best? While well, you come here, you go to the Mountain Weather Forecast, written by our friends at Environment Canada. They give a great synopsis of the day. They can then go through the day one and day two weather, complete with images, moving satellite loops. It's a great place for both beginners and pros to start their day. I start my day here every morning at about six o'clock in the morning, reading through the weather, getting a good feel of what's going on. And that guides me when I'm out there, when I'm forecasting in the office or that I'm going skiing with my buddies. Um, this is where I start my day every day. We've got a ton of educational resources here at Avalanche Canada too. Go to the Learn tab on our website. We have things like um, these just great videos and case studies like Cherry Bowl. Um, you can start to refresh some of your different Avalanche skills if it's been a while since you took a course. We have our brand new Avi Savvy that just launched. Um, this is super interactive. There's quizzes in here, there's videos, 
things like brushing up on companion rescue, backcountry resources, all that kind of good stuff. Digging into the nitty gritty of the avalanche forecast. This is a really cool place to come and kind of dust yourself off, get a good feel of what's going on again, thinking about the avalanche train exposure scale or eights ratings. So really encourage you to check this out, spend a little bit of time over a, a coffee or beer and, and get re-familiar with the, the Avalanche Canada products as we head into what will hopefully be a great and safe winter. And of course, Marty talked about Avalanche Canada training courses, and that has to do with all of our AST courses, AST1 courses, AST2. There's different refreshers that you can go out there and do, like companion rescue or managing Avalanche terrain. Um, and these can all be gateways if you decide you want to go be a professional snow dork to things like the the um, Canadian Avalanche Association professional programs. But quite honestly, I think one of the best courses I ever took for how I actually operate in the backcountry is my AST2. That really gave me the tools to start putting it all together, figuring out what train was in, what train was out, and how I could actually go out there and make game time, slope specific decisions in the backcountry. So an AST1 is great. It shows you that there's an avalanche, that there's actually an avalanche hazard out there, what avalanche train looks like, but it really doesn't tell you much more than that. It helps you to read a forecast. I really want to put a plug in for the AST2. I think this is a phenomenal course. And I think that every seasoned backcountry user really needs to get that one underneath their belt. So we talk about the essential gear, and Marty's hit on this already. That first thing is a digital three antenna avalanche transceiver. So you know, for the more experienced folks, if you're upgrading your beacon, if it's, if it's a digital three antenna unit, think about selling it. But if it's an old piece of history, like a single or double antenna transceiver, don't go selling it on the stoke list or Revy Cell, please. We don't want to be handing the new folks these antiquated pieces of gear. So if you're buying or selling, making sure that you're, um, it's a digital three antenna avalanche transceiver. If it's not that, it's too far gone. It's like the old flip phones. Nobody wants it. Next thing is a shovel. That's a dedicated avalanche shovel. Um, it should have an extendable handle. It should have it be a nice size, not too small, like the, the this teaspoon size shovel. And then a probe. These things work in tandem or in conjunction with each other to help you find your buddies when it hits the fan. Here in the Monashes and the Selkirks, you need to be running a 320 centimeter probe. That's the standard. You might once in a while you'll see like the 200 centimeter or two meter probes. They're just too short for what we're trying to our deep snowpacks that we're trying to work in out here. So only the nice long probes and when you look at a probe, or if you're getting yours out for the first time in a season, or just been rattling around your backpack for a year or two, take it apart. Now is the time to actually take it apart, look at all the little ferrules and connections. All this gear is super important. Make sure there's no rust on it. Make sure the cable isn't abrading. It's only November, this is the time to dust off our avalanche eyeballs and our gear, so inspect that stuff. It's like a parachute. You wanna know that it's working darn well. Recommended gear, avalanche airbags. I wear an avalanche airbag every day at work, and I ski tour with it personally quite a bit too. They and I, whenever I'm sledding, I wear it because it's just a no-brainer. Um, they've gotten much lighter than they used to be. There's some phenomenal airbag packs that are out there now, and it's not a silver bullet. An avalanche airbag pack does not necessarily mean you're going to survive, be able to ride out of avalanches, but it, it is a little bit of a margin of error, it, and it improves your. It basically. You, you're skiing down, you grab this handle, this bag inflates behind you with a canister or a fan, and it just increases your buoyancy to help you stay higher in the debris flow and hopefully get kicked out of that avalanche earlier. That's what avalanche airbag packs are all about. So it's not an essential piece of gear, but it is a recommended piece of gear. The next thing that, boy, this is almost becoming an essential piece of gear, um, is some, this is an inReach Mini, as I personally have one of these, is some way to communicate with the outside world for a number of reasons. You know, we're gonna get into the, the trip planning stuff in a, in a bit here, but you need to be able to let people know where you are. You also, it's great to be able to talk with the rescuers. So if you can say that, you know what, we've got someone with a, a sprained ankle out here, they're not gonna be able to ski out, um, but we're gonna require some assistance and we've got it covered for the time being, we've got a fire going. That this allows the rescuers, that gives them a much fuller picture about what the rescue is gonna look like or you can communicate directly with the, um, the rescue team. There's an SOS button on these things. Or maybe it's just something as simple as saying, hey, you know what, roommate, I'm gonna be an hour late, but don't worry about me, everything is great. And that can just take the stress out of the people who love us. So it's just an essential piece of gear for me now. I, even when I'm like riding my mountain bike in the Alpine, it's so little, I'll just tuck it into my, my pack and take it everywhere with me. Cause I just wanna be able to communicate in case I have a wreck somewhere. Cause it doesn't take much to strand ourselves in the winter. I think mean, Marty is 
and I've traded this idea back and forth a lot about, yeah, we're out there ski touring in the backcountry in the winter. If things go wrong back there, you gotta be prepared. You gotta be able to talk to the outside world. Last thing is a radio, and that's about talking with each other. You know, as pros, we've always got radios because it's a lot more, it's just a lot cooler to say, hey, Marty, what did, how did that run go for you? Are you regrouped? Do you want me to come on down there? As opposed to yelling down there, Marty, Marty, and a lot of arm waving. It's just, it's unprofessional. It's not very couth. So it's way better to be able to talk to each other, to be able to share information about the run, or if you can't find someone, give them a radio check. You know, that is a, it, it's the tool to have out there. So get a radio, know how to use it. Um, can't say enough about that. Everyone should really have radios in my opinion. So the next resource I wanna talk about is the trip planner. And this is the place where you can take the current conditions that you see in the avalanche forecast and, and match it with a, what we call eights ratings or avalanche train exposure scale ratings. So many, many areas throughout the province for both skiing, sledding, snowshoeing have been rated with eights ratings by professionals. And then by using the algorithm and the trip planner here at Avalanche Canada, you can actually take, it'll, it'll help you to take the current danger ratings and match you to what kind of train is appropriate. So in this case, all the green stuff that you're seeing here on the map is simple train. And looking at this, this forecast of the day, moderate, moderate, low, the, you can see on the left there, it actually says that if we choose simple train, that's gonna be an area that we just have to use normal caution. Now, if we start getting into some of the, what you see here as the purple train, that is the challenging terrain. We have to use some extra caution there, but anything in the black is just not recommended at this time. So this can be a great great place to come and just independently double check your idea for the day, decide if it's a good idea. Um, you can also download the KMLs here and have additional information. All those big red lines that you'll see on the, on the screen there, those are actually the, the bigger known avalanche paths that, um, that come into contact with the access road. So lots of great information here. Great place to, to work on your trip planning. And then we get into the Mountain Information Network, or MIN, as we affectionately call it. The MIN submissions have been going off this year, which we're so appreciative for, because a lot of professional operations are not going to be running this season in this season of COVID that we're in. So for the now more than ever, really relying on you, the backcountry users, to give us information about your day. Did you see any avalanches? What, what, what are some great photos that you have from the day? Are there snow in the trees? Um, how deep was the skiing or sledding? Was it totally over the hood? Did it change? Did the sun come out and did it get wet? Um, all these little pieces of information are, are just gold to the forecasters as they try and take these giant forecast regions and get the, the real scoop on them and figure out what's going on. So help us help you. Please submit to the MIN after you're out there having your day. You can make it as simple or as complex as you want. Honestly, I make my mins pretty simple. I usually go with the quick report, I throw a couple photos in, and I usually type in two or three sentences, and that's all I'm asking you to do as well. Don't worry about sending professional. This is not a professional exchange here. Just tell us what you were seeing out there. You can even use terms like it was slidey. I don't care, I just wanna know what you're seeing out there. Helps me a lot as a forecaster. The red dots are avalanche incidents. So these are people who are, are brave and humble and coming forward to help us learn from their incidents or avalanche involvements. Um, it's incredible when people do this because it's very easy just to take the uh, the shoot, shovel, and shut up approach and not share your incident because you're embarrassed. But as, as professionals, as people who work at Avalanche Canada, we've had incidents on the clock. The backcountry is an unpredictable place at times. Um, we share them right here with you too. If, if a professional is having a near miss, you're, we're going to share our own our own near misses with you, and we have done that for years. Um, so please do share with us, and please. You know, when that's being done, like let's embrace that as a backcountry com community and let's look out for each other out there and learn from each other's mistakes. We don't, no one wants to be armchair quarterback in someone else's accident. It's just, it's not helpful. But so sharing is, is just, is a great thing. Really appreciate that. So we need folks to get that gear, that digital three antenna transceiver, shovel, probe, get the training like an AST1 and then building into the AST2 or maybe refreshing your course. And then get the app as well. The app, you can submit mins, you can grab the forecast, um, all that kind of stuff. And then of course, just to get home safe. So before we switch over to Parks Canada here, I'm gonna ask Nancy to get our second draw prize from RMR. We've got another, another prize day pass we're gonna give away. So Nancy, if you can dig into the magic box here and pull someone out, that would be great. 
Okay, I pulled into the magic hat. And um, Patty Shaw, who won the first one, actually uh, doesn't ski. And so she wants to give it away. So I pulled two out. And the replacement for Patty is Bettina Mueller. And that's a day pass at RMR. And the new prize for a day pass at RMR goes to Brooklyn Rushton. So you guys, you can contact us at producer at avalanche.ca and we'll set you up with your prizes. Thanks. Hey gang, I just want to ch uh, chime in here as well. I'm noticing lots of great questions showing up in the chat box and a couple of hands raised. Really appreciate it. We're going to get to some questions after uh, a couple more presentations. So uh, keep it in your mind. We're going to get to you soon and keep putting those questions in the chat box. We're going to hand it over to Marty. I feel like save so many of the good questions for like Rubens and Nadine. <laughs> I'm excited for them to present. Absolutely. Um, psyched to be diving into Parks Canada, you guys. I'm so excited about it. I'm, I've even like put on my my Rogers Pass toque here. <laughs> if you don't know what a toque is, then you shouldn't be here in the first place. <laughs> um, thank you, Parks Canada, for this. And also, thanks, Parks Canada, to uh, get the ability or the opportunity to talk about Rogers Pass. You guys, this one's an exciting one because Rogers Pass is legit. Growing up in Canmore and spending my whole life coming over to Revelstoke to fly into the Blanket Chalet, I had spent my teens and childhood looking up at these mountains. This place is legit. It's kind of like the big wave surfing for backcountry skiing. And why I'm saying that is this place is so intimidating. You look at this picture, There's this is like, this is an avalanche course right here, one photo. You can't go five minutes in Rogers Pass without hitting some of the largest avalanche terrain in the industry. So what I'm getting at is we are very lucky to be able to be in Rogers Pass to access the terrain, but it comes at a lot of skill. So I just, I can't make it more clear. This place is big, this is intimidating, and this is for those that really know what's up. So with knowing what's up, you guys, the way that Rogers Pass was set up from the start was for transportation. Started with the railway, now it's a national highway. I can tell you very clearly, I don't work there, but it is a privilege for us to be able to access this terrain. Their main concern is not getting us sweet skiing in Rogers Pass. They need to keep that highway vein, like that transportation pipeline going. So that's why they've got avalanche control. They've hired the Canadian military to shoot explosives into the mountains to keep it open. So there was a long period of time where it was actually pretty restricted to, to ski this terrain. What I'm getting at is we are so lucky to access the terrain, and but they've implemented this system that you guys, we all have to agree on. So it is the winter permit system. And there's a sweet little video that's coming up later. There's areas in Rogers Pass that are open for ski touring. You can take this like little entrance way out and you can ski tour out. There's areas that are completely permanently closed, like in this uh, photo here. And then there's also areas that are like um, sometimes open and sometimes closed, kind of based on if they need to shoot the area or not. So to be very clear, when these areas are posted as open, that doesn't mean it's the same as a ski resort. If it's open, that doesn't mean it's like, been avalanche mitigated, even if it's been blasted a ton from the Canadian military. When it's open, it means we're allowed to ski tour it. But how the system works is you have to check in every day. So if you don't have an annual winter permit pass, which you can get online, taking the, the course, you actually have to go into the Rogers Pass Info Center, which is um, up at the, uh, the actual Rogers Pass. There's like a RPC up there. You can check in to see if it's open or closed. So if, you're going to be in town and you're going to do this a bunch. You can actually take the test and you have a pass that says that you know what's up. It takes about 45 minutes. You have to get 100%. You can't mess it up. You need to be able to check in to know if it's open or closed because we need 100% compliance because if we mess this up, the park system is just going to close it all down. So how it works, as I was saying, 7 a.m. every morning, you check in if it's open or closed. Um, you can get this, this uh, annual winter permit uh, pass. Daily permits are the Rogers Pass Discovery Center, and you need to check before you go. I keep saying that. <laughs> so you guys, um, I'm gonna pop onto the next slide, slide here. 
There's areas kind of like you can see this is where the Rogers Pass Info Center is. There's areas that you can kind of sneak through and go out ski touring. But as you can imagine, as you leave, all of this is avalanche terrain. This is the mellowest stuff in Rogers Pass, but you're kind of in it. So I can't say this enough. We can't mess this up. There's a sweet video coming down the pipeline here. I want you guys to check it out. And uh, if you have any questions of this, hire a guy, take an avalanche course, check into the, uh, the uh, RPC. Thanks Parks Canada for letting us ski tour in Rogers Pass. <laughs> All right, let's hit this video. Awesome, you guys. So in summary, uh, winter permit, a national park pass, which is different. That is something that you purchase to access a national park that's summer, that's winter, and um, make sure we nail this. So next up, super excited to give another prize. So Nancy, we have another day ticket from RMR. I'm, we're, just, we're just like picturing, you're putting your hand in this little box and pulling someone's name out, but do you have a name? <laughs> You bet. Next. I'm spinning. I'm spinning the wheel here, and the winner of a day pass at RMR is Carolyn Ose. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. It's O H S E, the last name, Carolyn Ose. So again, contact us at producer at avalanche.ca, and we will set you up with your prize. Thanks. I wish you could just like run on down. We could give you a prize, a big high five or a hug, but we'll have to save that when the COVID times are over. Um, thanks again, RMR. Thanks again, Parks Canada. I can't say it enough. You guys figure it out. <laughs> we got to be able to. Um, we got to be able to operate correctly. Uh, next up, we've got Grant hitting. Yeah, uh, he is actually going to represent the Revelstoke Search and Rescue. Um, oh, Grant, you also have a costume change. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave this off. Yes, I do, Marty. Yes, I do. Let me get my other screen going here. Okay, and that should be up. Hey, one thing to talk about with Rogers Pass too, is I was up there earlier this week and right now there can be one person in the visitor center at a time. 
So if you think you're going to be visiting Rogers Pass really at all this year, it, it would be a great idea to do the annual winter permit, um, get that test over and done with. They're going to email you that a few days later, so it's not quite an instant thing. Uh, but just put a plug in for that too, because if it's only one person at a time, it's going to take a long time in the morning to uh, to get that pass. So think about that if you're going to be be touring at the pass at all this year. So costume change. Why is this costume change happening? Well, because now we're getting into the anatomy of a search and rescue from the good folks at Revy Search and Rescue or Revy SAR as we call them. This is an all volunteer organization that comes and is filled with just amazing quality here in Revelstoke. Mountain guides, forecasters, uh, ski patrollers. It's a really incredible group with a lot of experience. Um, but you don't want to see them because that means you've had a bit of an, an uh, bit of an accident if you're going to come see these folks. So folks have accidents in the backcountry all the time. In fact, Revelstoke SAR goes up to over 60 uh, missing or injured people every winter. You know, I brought up this the ski resort map again here because. People have died at the ski hill. Marty talked about it. There's signs that you will discover as you start to ski in the backcountry trip there that straight up say that, that people have died. It's not for laughs. It happens. The place is real. When you get out of bounds, um, it gets real, real quick. And I think we've kind of, we've been over that point quite a bit. So what do you do if you're having an accident? So obviously first, um, you know, you've literally got 10 minutes, best case scenario, to get your buddies out of the snow if there's an avalanche. So Revy SAR is not coming to dig your friends out of the avalanche, at least not alive, unfortunately. Any kind of rescue you're going to be conducting, avalanche rescue, you got to get it, you have to conduct it yourself. And that's why you have to be prepared for self rescue with all those tools we've been talking about all night. But let's say you get that person out, or let's say you just have an injury or you're lost. First thing you need to do is call 911, which is great if you've got cell, but if you don't have cell, that's when it's going to really pay to have one of those um, satellite communication devices. You can just hit the SOS and that can get the ball rolling. Um, next thing you need to do is to start a fire. I have been on training programs with other mountain guides where, surprise, um, we are going to have to start a fire. And it has not gone very well, surprisingly, because guess what? It's really hard to start a fire in the winter when it's snowing or that really those wet times. This is a wet part of the world. Starting a fire is difficult. Um, there's all sorts of different little tricks you can do. What I've gone and done now is I have my waterproof matches. I've always got a lighter with me, too. My waterproof matches live in a waterproof container. And then I've actually, I go and just buy some of the um, over the counter, you get it right at Valhalla here in town, um, the over the counter fire starter. That stuff just works like a hot dam. You can carry one little brick of it and it kind of lives in the bottom of my pack with my Leatherman. And I've always got it in a Ziploc bag when I'm ski touring because I have realized how hard it is to start fires in the winter in these mountains. So starting a fire just helps to, uh, help, it can help people see you. It can be a great thing for your own psychological benefit if you got a weather at night out there. Um, so yeah, be prepared to start a fire. Make yourself visible. Um, it's The dark colors are really hard to see from the air. So all the things you can do to make yourself visible, starting a fire, wearing brightly colored clothing, uh, maybe you've got like a rescue tarp or something that's nice and bright. Um, so make yourself as visible as possible. Do whatever you can to kind of keep yourself safe, but visible. So you know, best case scenario, the rescue can take, you know, it can be as short as an hour, but it can be as long as you spending the night in the back entry overnight, because you make that 911 call or you, you hit your satellite device that then goes to the RCMP and it has to go to the RCMP for them to then create a case number with emergency management BC. It then goes to the local SAR manager and these people all work regular jobs. They're not just sitting there in their Gore-Tex and their ski boots waiting to come and rescue you. They're at their regular jobs and they're going to get a call or a text letting them know there's a SAR call out now. That SAR manager is going to get a team together by, by calling all the other members of the search and rescue group and whatever other resources might be required like an avalanche dog, to sift, um, specialized rescue equipment, any of that kind of stuff. They have to then go all meet at the SAR base and get ready and prepare if they're going to fly in there or whatever or sled in there, whatever it's going to be. They have to evaluate the risk for themselves because they can't put themselves in danger. You can kind of see all these steps we're going through. This is going to take time. Then they're going to get the transport going. And finding you out there is like finding a needle in a haystack in these mountains. These are big, bad places, and it's tough to find people out there, especially if it's near dark. Um, Rescue might not be happening quick. So that's why you have to be prepared to have your own self-rescue. So 
talk a little bit about the 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 three T's here, which are just trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. So I've actually I downloaded this map today as we we're putting this together, the Adventure Smart Trip Planning app. And it's pretty sweet. It just goes through, it lets you talk about where you're going, who you're going to register your trip plan with, um, specific details about where you're going. It, it puts it all together in a nice way, and you can just send it to your friend or that trusted individual to let them know where you're going to go. And that's a that's a great thing, having a trip plan. Um, as professionals, we've always got a trip plan that we're working with someone. Training is obviously starting tonight and then getting into all those courses we're talking about and then taking the essentials, which are things like fire starter, um, all the avalanche rescue gear, water, good uh, waterproof clothing, all that kind of stuff. So it's a great idea just to download that app and check it out for yourselves, play with it a little bit. And as we're doing that, they've actually got a great little one minute video that I'm going to bring up here. Okay, very cool. Thanks for that. We're going to stop showing the video right now. Give me one second. Colin, I'm not going to share my webcam just yet. The suspense is killing us, Grant. <laughs> uh, whoopsie doodle. There we go. So, Nancy, we've got one more. Uh, not one more we've got another prize what are we going at now yeah i have pulled another name out of the hat for a day pass at rmr and this is for lloyd bjorkland lloyd bjorkland you want a day pass at rmr you can contact us producer at avalanche.ca and we'll set you up with your prize thanks awesome okay we're going to get into one of my favorite portions of the evening which is talking sleds. Who's psyched to go sledding? I'm psyched. It's already been super good. We had our training here last week and sledding was ridiculous as it always is, riding new 850s. Um, I grew up ski racing, came to Rebel Soak as a backcountry skier and a sledder. And gosh, in the last 11 years, the sleds have just gotten so incredible. Um, and we have the, the, the world famous Rebel Stokes Mobile Club here that we're gonna talk a little bit about. The Mobile Club is a, a great club here in Rebel Stoke. They welcome new users all the time. They have this big snowmobile club um, clubhouse you'll see out there on Boulder Mountain. Then they've got a number of uh, different backcountry lodges essentially that are in these remote locations that are just killer. So at Frisbee and Boulder, they've got these lodges up high. You know, uh, it'll be a little bit different year. We probably won't be cracking beers in the uh, in the chalet this year with COVID in play, but they are good safety shelters. Um, and it doesn't matter how you got there, whether it's your sled on top of your Subaru, like they're just there to have a good time, help you make good decisions. And they're doing amazing job wearing, like grooming our trails and just this like amazing access to the Alpine. Sledding in Revelstoke is sick. So, what are some of the things that the Slow Wheel Club wants you to think about? Well, one of those things is wearing a helmet. And that doesn't mean your cool half lead ski helmet. I mean, being that I've been doing this for a long time, I've pointed out and got myself a full on carbon fiber, full face helmet because things happen fast on a sled. 
you can decelerate so quickly and your face is just in the handlebars or you're bouncing off the side of the sled. Like, I feel like sledding can be such a full contact sport out there. So wear an appropriate helmet. Really wanna encourage you to be wearing a full face out there when you're on the machine. Do not tow. So if you're using the groomed access roads at Frisbee or Boulder, no towing. The reason that is is because if your buddy is just slightly if you're towing and slightly outside the line, like people are going up and down at all times of the day up there at Boulder and Frisbee. So if you're using the designated the grooming, the groomed access trails, no towing. You can tandem. Um, it's obviously best for each person to have their own machine, but just no towing. You know, when you're, when you're out there and maybe you're split boarding or maybe you're doing some uh, sled skiing, really look above and below. So are there snowmobilers below you? Are there, is there someone above you? We gotta really respect each other as backcountry users out there so that we don't cause avalanches to come down on someone that's below us. So this is just basic common courtesy in the backcountry. So, you know, look around, know who's around and let's not jump into lines when there's people below us. Another thing is just to carry your skis and snowboards horizontally. So you can't have the backpack with your skis or snowboards sticking out the side because that's just an easy way to clip somebody as they're going by you or to get hung up in a tree um, and have a legit rack for your sled. There's a number of great options out there, but have something, have something good and know how to use it. Have it well set up. Um, quickest way to lose a bungee and have it get uh, tossed into your track is to put it on your snowmobile. Like it's like have a proper kit. You're in Revelstoke, honor the place, run tight gear. Don't follow tracks. Like, yeah, you've all followed the, the one ton truck that says, uh, don't follow me. It has a sticker on it. It might say, don't follow me. You won't make it. It's true. Uh, wow. I've been sledding for gosh, about 14 years now. Like I think I'm a pretty average Revelstoke sledder, but the caliber that's up around here is high. People here are snowmobile magicians. Don't follow tracks around here if you don't know where they go because you, they might have dropped way down into something that unless you are a damn good sledder, you're not gonna be able to come back out of it. And that means you're calling a, a helicopter in to have your sled pulled out of there. Like it happens all the time. You live here long enough, it, it, just look in the sky, you will see broken snowmobiles getting carted out by 212s here, helicopters in the winter really don't follow tracks. It, I can't state that strongly enough. People get into some gnarly stuff here and you might not make it. Get trained. So we've been harping on this all evening because it's just so critical. Just to get that training, that's what allows you to start to understand the snowpack and get out there and have a good time and get home safely. So those are all the, the key messages from the good folks at the Rebel Soaks Snowmobile Club. We have got one more uh, giveaway here and it's going to be it's actually two giveaways um, just as as Nancy's as she's getting these giveaways and finding the lucky winners I just want to throw a quick poll up just to know are there any how many sledders are out there how many folks I'm really curious tonight Colin if you throw that poll up um, are folks out here psyched for sledding like I am um, you know I think a lot, I use the sled to go ski touring but a lot of times I just use the sled to go sledding what are you guys and gals doing out there? It's great now because even like you can get an XM for four or five grand, which was kind of a groundbreaking snowmobile in 2013. Like they've just gotten so good. We got some sledders out there, 14% so far. Feeling the two Six percent voted so far. Cool. Still a few more votes coming in. I'll let it hang for a minute or two. Yeah, so we've got, a, I'm, I'm kind of watching it there and it looks like we're about 20% of us are psyched on sledding. Um, I will say that like, if you're if you're not quite, haven't gotten that bite just yet, like there are a lot of, there's some great places like Rogers Pass, the, the slack country and the back country touring out of the ski hill. Um, there are so many good places you can get to with your truck, but it's about 1% of the places you can get if you get some snowmobile skills and start exploring out there because we are surrounded by this incredible backcountry. And that's the real amazing thing about living here in Revelstoke. So even though you're not that psyched on sledding yet, like give it a season or two, the, the bite might come for you. With that, let's turn it over to Nancy for a few, uh, we've got two prize packs from the Snowmobile Club. Yeah, thanks Grant. We've got two prize packs from 
the Revelstoke Snowmobile Club. And the first winner is Nahani McKay. And the second winner is Tom Atkin. So Nahani McKay and Tom Atkin, you can contact us at producer at avalanche.ca and we'll set you up with your prize packs. Thank you. Awesome. So that's a great segue to introduce my friend. Ironically, she's just down, we live on the same street. She's just down the street from me at another computer. Um, but Nadine is just a ripper. Nadine Overwater is an Avalanche ambassador for Avalanche Canada. Um, she started snowmobiling at age seven, which explains how she's so gosh darn good at it and never looked back. In 2007, she got into serious mountain sledding. You've watched the videos, you've seen Nadine in action. Um, one of the really cool things is that she is just such a nice person to be around that it she really lets her riding do the talking. She spends 100 days on a sled a year, riding with all different skill levels. I've done a clinics with Three Avalanche Canada with Nadine. She makes my riding better. Um, so she's a professional and she can help you out with professional level avalanche training. In 2012, Nadine started this really cool thing called the La Nina Sled Camp. And it's a venue for female riders to get out there and shred, build confidence in a positive environment, away from the stress, having to keep up with their partners. Nadine hopes to continue influencing and educating other women to get out there and shred as often as they like. I'm gonna turn it over to Diener now. Thanks so much. Nadine, you're just muted on your mic, so just click that unmute and you should be good. Still got you muted. Oh, it might be my fault now. There you are, you're live. Yes, thank you. Um, hey everybody, I am sorry for that little glitch there. Um, pretty excited and honored to be presenting tonight alongside people like Marty and Grant and Chris. Um, pretty neat to uh, imagine that the token sledder chick gets to be presenting with people like those guys. So thank you for having me. Um, now that we've seen kind of how many sledders we have out there, it makes me a bit nervous because I see that most of you guys are, are skiers, but that's okay. Hopefully you can take something away from my presentation. Um, so who am I? That token sledder girl. Um, I'm a professional backcountry snowmobiler. I'm a mediocre snowboarder. I am an ambassador for Avalanche Canada and has have been for four seasons now i think um and i also am an avalanche tech for the forestry industry here around revelstoke so i have a bit of a background in the avalanche world um but uh i'm gonna sort of target this presentation around a couple of themes that have been weighing on my mind because i know that these guys all had the other pieces of the puzzle ca um, carved out for you so we talked about the gear and the training and all of that stuff. So I wanted to talk about a couple of different things tonight, if you will bear with me. One of those is the expected high use in the backcountry this year. So we haven't talked too much about that tonight, but I have a pretty sneaking suspicion that we're gonna see a lot more people out there. So I just wanted to touch on that with you. And then I was gonna share with you some of the mistakes I've made in the past, because I think we're all fallible and um, I think it's really important to learn from each other. So even though they call me a professional snowmobiler, I've made a lot of mistakes and I'm hoping that you can learn from some of them. So, I mean, I just put some nice pictures up so you guys could look at those while I talk, but uh, I made a few phone calls and in the last couple of weeks while I've been sorting out my sled and everything, I've been talking to sled dealerships and these are some of the things that I've been hearing. Um, from these people um at the dealerships widespread sled sales are up 40 to 50 percent um so they're selling a lot of sleds and you can even see it in the used market i have a lot of friends that have been trying to buy machines this year and it's been really difficult you know they're just like moving on the market pretty quickly um snow check machines so these are the machines that you have to spring check um there's like out of the three dealerships I talked to this year, there's between 80 and 125 people waiting for people to back out of their snow checks. So that means um, not only are the used sleds selling, but there's no new, new sleds and the new sleds that
around a couple of our local ski shops too, just to see if the trips were similar here today. And I talked to uh, uh, and Skookum, you know, they had the same as me, like 50% increase in skis. Uh, Full avalanche soul this year. So, um, I know a lot from the poll that was right here that um, 13 percent of you guys said that it was first travel stoke. So potentially, you know, those people um, that are buying these new kits who are the increased users that we're going to see in the back. And I was kind of trying to think on on who there is. I'm flipping through my slides here. Hey, it looks like we lost Nadine's mic and uh, it was coming through a little bit broken to, there. To, um, to help give her yourself to... be more aware and be more backcountry safe. Um, hey Nadine, have we still got you there? Are you hearing me? Oh yeah, we got you just a bit. Okay, folks, it looks like we may have lost Nadine. Really unfortunate. Um, lots of great info though. Uh, uh, great kind of uh, mindset around, you know, just really being co uh, conscious of um, e extra users in the backcountry this season. There's gonna be a lot of extra people out there, a lot, a lot of people who are kind of seeking out training or ought to be seeking out training and we really wanna encourage that. So I'm gonna move us along to um, uh, Marty. In fact, he's gonna introduce us to our next presenter who is Chris Rubens. Yeah, I'm super psyched to see the talent in Revelstoke. Nadine has been on the world stage sledding videos. It's so rad to see what Nadine's done. You guys already know this. There's so many professional skiers in Revelstoke. People have been moving all over the world to this town. It's cool to see Chris. He moved here long before the ski hill started because of the snow. He brought in things like Matchstick Productions filming here mid-February, which is like a weird thing. So Chris now has traveled the entire world filming the, the most incredible movies on earth. Um, now he is an avalanche, uh, sorry, an avalanche ambassador for Avalanche Canada. He's one of my best friends, helped me out at the Blanket Glacier Chalet. And he's honestly one of my best ski touring partners. The way he communicates and prepares himself and holds himself in the mountains is why I choose Chris to be one of my uh, ski touring partners. So without further ado, super psyched for Chris to dive in to his presentation. Rubens, why don't you take it away? Guys, normally I throw Chris out of the bus for these sorts of things. So it's like as much as I wanted to uh, <laughs> set him up for failure, I'm really psyched for him to talk about things. Chris really talks a lot about mentorship. Um, we've all seeked it. Chris and I grew up in the Rockies, um, but uh, he's done most of his filming around town and or sorry, lately he's done filming around town. He's been all over the world. But Chris, I don't need to say any more. Dive right into it, homie. Hey, Chris, don't forget to unmute yourself there. We got you live. There we go. All right. Perfect. Um, perfect. I'll just get this playing. Yeah, thanks, uh, Marty, there for the kind words. And uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome to be here tonight uh, talking to you guys. Uh, we talked to a few of these over the years, but we've definitely had like a lot of mentors growing up. I think a lot of people have said that. So uh, we do think these things are super important and it's uh, super fun to kind of get back. And normally we're like in a more environment where we can talk talk more personally to people, but uh, this is where we're at. And uh, I think this is great too. And it definitely like is uh, challenging on our technical skills. So we're we're learning. Um, anyway, so I'm Chris Rubens. Uh, if you guys don't know me, I've lived in Revelstoke for 14 years now, and somehow I've been a professional skier for basically uh, 20 years now, which is pretty crazy to me. Um, so I've seen my fair fair share of things, 
And I feel like a lot of the times I'm up here doing some case study about uh, some close call that I've been in, but I've been really <laughs> kind of working on uh, not having those as much anymore. And uh, that's part of my personal growth, I guess. But um, what I really want to convey tonight is like we, we, we all talking about um, a lot of new people coming to the backcountry this year. And what I want to convey to you guys is like how um, you don't just become a backcountry skier overnight. This is something that takes years and years. And um, it's a really fun process to be a part of, but it's, it's not like riding a mountain bike where you can just kind of pick it up and, and everything kind of makes sense. There's a lot more to it. There's a lot more going on. Um, and so I'll start with my story. So this is my kind of history. Um, I grew up in Calgary and uh, I was super fortunate to have those parents that wanted us in the outdoors all the, all the time and, and they didn't really like, uh, they, wouldn't, they didn't push us into anything and they didn't like necessarily try to teach us everything. They just kind of let us explore and see for ourselves and kind of push us in the right directions and, and really gave us this like amazing respect for the outdoors and, and what it gave me was this really good common sense for the the outdoors right off the bat before I even got into any sort of ski touring like that. And I'm super grateful for that. Um, this is, um, I'm gapping on the name of this mountain. We always used to call it Mount Crazy. It's like, you can see the, uh, uh, the granddaddy Kuars behind there, but that's actually my first winter camping experience. I was probably like 12 years old or something like that in, in school and uh, digging, digging a little uh, snow cave there. So I was fortunate with that. And then uh, I grew up ski racing, but then uh, right at the end of high school there, I decided to quit ski racing. And I joined the Rocky Mountain Freeriders. And this is like kind of where I really started learning about how important it is to like surround yourself with good people. That's Guy Mowbray um, in the back there and Kevin Yurtis, they were coaches. And, and it was between like the people that were taking it and the coaches that just kind of you know, started steering me in the right direction right off the bat. Now, um, we glamorize ski touring. This is uh, me and my buddy, Steve Horlifson. Um, Eric, you guys may or may not know uh, Hoji. This is his brother, and we're, we're going ski touring for the day. And uh, you'll notice we don't have any ski touring bindings, but we probably have trekkers in the back. Um, what we definitely do do have is our avalanche safety gear. So we have our our beacons, our probe, our shovel. We never went out there without it. But when we were first getting in, this is like, I think we're like 18 here or something like that. And we're like first starting to go out on our own. And I remember ski touring up like the tightest trees because we knew we weren't going to get in an avalanche there or like walking on rocks and like just in these places. Like whenever there was a question, we would just like go to this default of places that we knew we weren't going to get an avalanche. And I mean, hopefully nobody followed our tracks or anything like that, but uh, uh, like we were, you know, we didn't know enough, but we knew enough that we didn't know enough uh, to get ourselves in trouble. So that's kind of how we alleviated that. And, and, and uh, we really like kind of learned from that, I think. Um, but for, for me, things progressed. Um, I kind of like started dabbling into the pro skier thing. And this is actually like the very first um, photo I ever had published by Ryan Curry, 2003 at uh, Sunshine Village. And uh, yeah, it was like, from there, it just like really kind of snowballed every year, it just got like a little bit more. I, I'd get a couple more photos published, start like filming segments, and then all of a sudden I'm traveling around the world, and, um, like have all these crazy opportunities. But like one of the the constants in there is that um, I would have like guides or ski patrols I was working with, like I was surrounded by more experience all the time. And what I did was I just like peppered them with questions about like, well, why, why do you think this? Like, what do you think about that? And, and that's how I gained a lot of my knowledge with, with the RMF. I took my first, uh, AST one, it was a, a rack back then. And then I've since like com completed my level one, uh, with, uh, the, Canadian avalanche there but uh a lot of my learning has been done in informally and it's like through these really experienced people that I just keep like peppering with questions um so that that's that was kind of my history um and now I want to go a little bit in the tools I know um Grant like and everyone's like really 
touched really well on these. Um, so I'm not gonna go too deep into them. Um, but these are the things that are in my bag all the time. They, they rarely, rarely come out. Um, Grant talked about like the communication device, so important, the shovel, the probe, the three antenna avalanche beacon, really important. I got a headlamp, a first aid kit. Uh, I'm a huge fan of ski straps. Um, I increasingly find that that's like my go-to with um, repairing. Um, I find it takes about five uh, ski straps to strap your boot to a ski. Um, my other big one um, that we don't talk about too much is a saw. Um, so this is my so snow saw. If I'm gonna be digging a pit, it's really hard to isolate a column without one of these. And I highly recommend that you get one that cuts wood. Um, if you're ever in any sort of like emergency situation, need to start a fire, like Grant said, it's really difficult. You need some fire starter, but this will really, really help you out. The other big one, um, and this is interesting, I think um, without diving too deep into it, you know, we always talk about bringing a first aid kit, um, is having some sort of toboggan. So if it's, if you got a way to rig your skis up, that's great. Um, what I am using increasingly all the time, this is like all guides pretty much have these in their bags. It's an Alpine Threadworks toboggan. Uh, you can put someone right in, you can make a shelter. This will save someone's life. It is pretty incredible. I've used it a bunch of different times, um, practicing with it, but also in scenarios and they really do work well. And you can move a patient like quite efficiently uh, down the mountain to like your heli pickup or just to a better spot. Um, with that, with that toboggan, I have a triple length, uh, triple length swing and a prusik with a couple carabiners, and so that's that's what you need to pull the toboggan. But these are these two little uh, things in my pack that I can do a lot with. With the triple length sling, you can do a really quick improvised uh, harness. You can pull someone out of the creek. Uh, there's like a a lot of things that you can do with that that little setup there. Um, and, and not a lot of weight. Um, so that's like, that's this is like my day of ski touring. So if I'm going snowmobile skiing, like ski touring, or if I'm going to the pass, or if I'm just going up to the hill, you know, the hill is great because you can go take a couple laps in bounds. You can leave your pack. You don't have to ski with it. But as soon as I'm going out of bounds, I, I want the same stuff in my pack because as soon as I cross that that boundary, that is like no different than anywhere else I go. So you just have like your normal like Gore-Tex suit there, puffy jacket uh, up in the top. That's a little like up jacket. A uh, bag, super important that you have a separate compartment for your avalanche um, gear. Keep that all separate, easily accessible. Two pairs of gloves, nothing like crazy there. This is, should all be kind of like pretty standard. So the process. So. Grant dived into this a bit. Um, and so we've, we've got the gear, we've got the mindset and we're like, we wanna go out into the mountains. And so what we really need to do is start gathering data. Um, and so if you don't have Avalanche Canada and these bulletins, you have to go start digging in snow. You just need to start digging in pits and see that history of what's happened that winter. And so digging pits at different elevations, different aspects, that's really important. We're super lucky with the Avalanche Canada around here. We we have really detailed bulletins where people are, they're gathering all this information and making it really easy for us. Um, but if if we didn't have it, this is kind of where we would start. Um, so this is the bulletin. Uh, Grant went through this pretty good. Um, up at the top there, you have the public avalanche forecast and then you have the forecast details. So we we say this quite a bit. It's like, if someone tells me, like if I'm going into a fight with somebody and someone tells me that my fighter is considerably dangerous, it doesn't really tell me a lot. But if that fighter, if someone tells me, oh, that fighter, he's got like a quick right jab, that tells me a lot. And so for me, it's all about the forecast details. It's super easy laid out. You got the weather for forecast, which is really important to see what's going on, the snowpack discussion and avalanche activity discussion. and um, especially this year, tons of people, myself included, are uh, doing the mins. Uh, those are awesome, like, especially if you're like wanting to check if 
some zones in like you can find all sorts of information with those little nims on like specific zones so those are really awesome and you learn a lot um by filling them out and the other thing i wanted to mention about um this side of things is so i used this a lot when i was first learning about snowpack and understanding and so i'd come in and i'd read this and i'd be like okay now it overlays this november 5th crest and i'd be like what's this november 5th crest and so the next day i'd go out and i'd go dig a pit and then i'd like find this crest and be like oh, okay this is what they're talking about so next time i read something like that i would like kind of be able to picture more what they're talking about that so i found that really helpful um so this is the next really really big part and i would say this is like kind of the given um, this is guides training up at blanket with the pack with the kapow crew and it's so important to take all those tools that we've talked about all night and put them into practice and making sure we know how to put them together and how to use them properly and efficiently before we get into those like situations. Cause if, if you're in an avalanche, like things are stressful. You do not want to really be like thinking you want to be like going through the process of what, what you've been taught and what you've been trained to do. So this group of people right here, like some really good friends, uh, a lot of people that I really look up to and they practice two or three times a year. We learn a lot every time we do it. Um, I do the same thing with the Solomon crew. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do that this year. Obviously, this is in France. Um, they're really interesting because they're European as well. So they have like all these other different techniques and we kind of like talk to each other and try their techniques and see like which which ones we like, which one we don't. Um, and ultimately, it's like whatever works for you, you know. So here we're shoveling. Um, and so this is like... <laughs> Kind of feel like i'm rushing through all this but uh there there is a, a lot to this whole scene so you you know you practice those basic skills but if you're ever involved in an avalanche scenario getting the person out that's just like the start now you have to like figure out how we're going to extract them we're going to have to do first aid um those sorts of things so all all these sorts of things are, are super important to practice and, and go over with the, the crew that you're going out with um, so I mentioned that toboggan, that's that toboggan in use at the Kapow Guides training there. Um, and that's actually me in the in the toboggan. And it was like, it's like I said, every time you do these things, you learn a lot. And just me getting strapped into them, I've strapped people into them, but getting myself strapped into them, I learned a lot about like how how comfortable it is and and all these things. And and every time you practice, you'll you'll definitely learn something. Um so kind of finish it off. A uh, good friend of mine there, Greg Hill, uh, obviously pretty legendary dude in this part of the world. But uh, it's really important to surround yourself with with good people when you're going to the backcountry. And uh, what you'll find and, and what I've found over the years is you, you'll kind of gravitate towards people with the same kind of risk tolerance as you. And, and everybody has different risk tolerances, and, and that's okay. But uh, you'll just kind of gravitate to friends that kind of have that same sort of risk tolerance, whether it's crazy large or crazy small or right in the middle. Um, but it's really important, like it's one thing for you to get that training, but it's kind of your buddies that are gonna be digging you out if you're you're in, in trouble. So it's really important to surround yourself with good people and uh, yeah, go out and enjoy the mountains with them because the mountains are amazing. They're an incredible place to be and uh, they've given us a lot. So. For everyone new out there, stoked that you're coming out and uh, yeah, go get educated. It, it, it's a really fun thing to do. It's not a, it's not like a bad education. It's a good education. Um, but yeah, thanks. I think that's that's it for me. That was awesome, Chris. We've got uh, Nadine back online here. We're going to take a second crack at her presentation, probably without her video feed. Um, and so I'm just going to see if I can hand it over to her right now. Give me one sec. Have we got Nadine? Hi, guys. You got me. Great. I'm going to shut off your video um, preemptively, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. You do what you need to. Um, <laughs> that means 
you're going to have to look at my giant head, which was my fear for this night. No, um, no, no, but that's okay. Yeah, we've actually gotten rid of your nice head, and we've got your presentation on the on the screen. Oh, wonderful. Okay, cool. So you guys can see this. I'm going to probably speed this up a little bit, and then if something happens, um, I kiss you all goodbye. But uh, I think I left off where I had kind of been talking to a bunch of uh, retailers and stuff saying that there's going to be a huge amount of backcountry usership this year. And where I was at was wondering who that backcountry user was going to be all these increased um, people going out and I figured, you know, it might be a large portion of the weekend warriors. So I was going to speak out to um, you know what you can do if you are someone that falls in this group um, to help yourself to get more or more education or knowledge or just a skill set and grant already alluded to a lot of these things but um the biggest thing is try not to be that guy that shows up on the weekend ready to roll and you have no clue what's happened throughout the week so um, you know, when you're on your work break or you're in your evenings, we're all scrolling a lot these days. So scroll into avalanche.ca and just read the bulletins. Even if you're not even in the mountains that day, read the bulletins. Grant went through everything, the Mountain Weather Network, um, the MINS, um, they do an online avalanche tutorial, which is really cool. But I'm not just preaching this stuff to you. Like the mountain weather forecast that you can get on Avalanche Canada is honestly, in my professional opinion, one of the best products out there. So use it. Um, they basically spell it out for you. Um, and this way you won't just show up on a Friday ready to ride with no clue what's happening. The other thing is talk to your friends about it. You know, make it a common conversation with your friends. Talk about where you're going to ride on the weekend what you've heard about the snowpack, nerd out a little bit, um, maybe change your decision. Maybe we should go to Golden this weekend. Maybe we should go to Veilmount. Um, you know, make backcountry awareness a more common conversation within your friend group. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other products. I already talked about the men, but there's also a ton of blogs, the snowmobile clubs, not only Revelstoke Snowmobile Club, but Golden has a really great like weekly forecast on conditions. Varda, which is the Vailmount Area Recreation Development Association, has awesome stuff to tell you what the conditions are like and any past observations and things like that. So use these things. You can Google them um, and find them. Also know your group. This has already been talked about in the past presentations, but not just what training everyone has, but really like what their skill set is or what their strengths are more. Um, you know, I've had situations where we just had to send Buddy with the inReach up the mountain to go deal with it because we had to get him out of our hair in an emergency situation. So you need to know who that guy is in your group so that you can deal with him. And again, I'm kicking a dead horse, but practice, you know, after dinner, throw the transceiver in the backyard and well, don't throw it, place it and go learn your equipment, um, learn how it works, learn how the functions work, play with your flagging function. Um, you know, I know it's all preaching to the choir, you guys know all this stuff, but these are things that I actually do. Um, so moving on, another thing, about having all these new users in the backcountry is you're going to see a lot of people without you see um, now I just be kind so learning so oh you what you don't help you these people help each other these people okay folks we gave it the college try we're losing Nadine again our apologies. Uh, we're going to see if we can get her in for some of this uh, question and answers. Um, I, I saw some really cool questions popping up in the chat here, and I think I saw at least one hand raised. So I'm going to invite um, 
Chris and Grant and Marty to, to throw on your webcams and your mics. And I'm going to see if we can um, run a few of these questions by you. So here we have, um, let's start in the chat box. I'm just going to scroll through here. We've got a question from Jeff. This is actually an interesting one. I, I'm not sure I know the answer to this. Jeff asks, do you have opinions on canister versus fan-based uh, avalanche airbags and their efficiency or effectiveness? Any thoughts? Grant, you want to hit that one first? <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> um, yeah, let's think about that for a sec. I, I've been kind of through the gambit. I've had a... I've had the canister bags. The great thing about a canister bag is it's just simple. Um, there's no moving parts. You don't need to recharge it. They actually tend to be some of the lighter bags around, which are great. Um, one of my other little side gigs is that I'm actually an equipment tester with Black Diamond equipment. And I've been through their airbag packs going through their fan-driven packs that ran off batteries. Um, but the latest models, like the, using the Alpride system, are some of the lightest packs around. You can recharge them with uh, two AA batteries. Um, I believe Scott makes bags like that as well. So those ones are pretty slick. That's kind of where I'm at now. Um, in terms of efficiency, they're all gonna work the same. It's really about finding a pack that fits you well. Um, and then testing them like every year. At the, the one thing I like about a fan-driven bag is you're able to test it more. I had the Arc'teryx pack too. That was a great, a great bag as well. But it was just kind of heavy with that giant battery. To be totally honest, um, but I think the the best thing about or the really important thing to consider with an airbag pack is that you test it because there are a lot of pieces of the equipment. You know, some of them actually have like a 22 cartridge, like all the ABS packs that releases. In the, in the trigger, it, it opens the line. Anyways, if you're looking at the airbag pack, make sure that you're gonna test it every year, maybe even twice a year, um, and find one that fits you. There's lots of great bags out there. Personally, I'm really into the Alpride system now, because it's just so light, it actually makes me wanna carry it that much more. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Weight is, is key out there, hey? And just having stuff that's maybe in production, maybe kind of steering away from stuff that's uh, discontinued would probably be a good good bet as well. Uh, we've got some comments that we're kind of backing up some of the com uh, some of the things that were mentioned during your presentations. Alpine Threadworks is awesome. So like that that sled that was being showed off, and they have a good, they've got a, a great uh, leg splint as well. This is well, well known. All these guys know about it. Um, Gautier asks, what's the best bag size, like your backpack size for backcountry days? What kind of volume are you guys rocking? Guys, I kind of like dive into the 32 to 40 liter backpack. I'm sure Nadine's probably going to say a little bit less because you can strap things to a snowmobile. But I like a backpack that you can kind of cinch down. I really like something that's got a top flap that you can kind of pack in. And then on days that uh, we're not going as far, maybe it's uh, off the ski hill, it can kind of cinch that down. But, uh, you know, the key things, super warm jacket, you've got a first aid kit, you've got some sort of toboggan kit thermos or water and food and then from there the further you go a rogers pass backpack is a little bit bigger than a off the ski hill backpack compared to like a blanket glacier chalet backpack so that's what i'm saying awesome and just reminding yeah, that, folks that the uh, the raise hand feature is available too so if you want to chat your question to us in in real life that that works too somebody was going to mention something i cut you off I was just going to say that with bags, it's like better to go a little bit bigger than smaller. It's like really right. easy. Like most bags now, you can cinch them down if you don't have enough stuff in them, but it's really hard to make them bigger if they're Absolutely. too small. Yeah. So we've got another great question here from Sean. This is this is key. This is maybe a good, well, actually, this is a good question for a few people. Uh, what characteristics in a snow pit test do you look for to determine if it's safe to ski? like the number one question yeah. <laughs> I, I want to know that quite now. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, jump in. I'll, I'll actually say that digging snowpack digging pits is, is great and we and we default to that a lot but I will tell you that at work I tend to dig more holes in the snow than I do personally mm -hmm. and I ski a fair amount with Marty and Rubens and we really don't dig all that many holes and I'll tell you why because we're really looking at the avalanche forecast and we're looking to see what it's talking about and then we're doing very specific investigations in the snow so if, if we know there's a, a deep persistent weak layer we're gonna we're gonna dig down and find that we might be doing some testing on it but really we're never gonna let the snow a snow pit kind of 
we, we have a plan for the day long before we're, we're digging snow pits out there. We know if there's a persistent weak layer or a, a deep persistent slab that we're gonna be scaling our terrain back accordingly. So we're never gonna get out to a spot and be like, well, you know, it's not as bad as I thought because this one snow pit that I dug here gave me great results. That is a trap. And so you have to be really careful with, with snow pit tests. Sudden failures, things that happen fast, like cash register door failures when you're doing those kind of tests are obviously watch out situations. Um, but I think that what we're doing, the, I, where I find myself doing the most snow pit work um, is just with new snow overnight, because that's something we're trying to get a handle on. So you'll see all of us down there as professionals, like digging down in it, um, doing little shovel shears, like doing really quick and fast tests. But I don't want to waste 30 minutes at a time digging a snow pit test. I want to go out there with a plan for the day that's conditions appropriate, and seeking train its conditions appropriate by using resources like the trip planner, the min, um, and then and then use that as opposed to, to really letting the snow pit test tell the big story. Yeah, you're really using it as a way to kind of see if your expectations are playing out in the snowpack or not. So you're kind mm -hmm. of trying to answer your question, see if see if uh, what you think is happening is actually happening, and maybe using it as a way to kind of dial back your decision rather than to dive into something that you weren't planning to that day. But Marty, yeah. I do. Yeah, I really want to challenge everyone that's on this call, especially with the most of you having the AST1. Is is Grant and the team at Avalanche Canada are really diving into the Avalanche problems. So. I want all of you guys to look at the avalanche problems and then ground truth what they are saying in the field. So you're not using an avalanche pit to make the decision. You are just taking what you've read from the bulletin, seeing what's in the snowpack, and that will stimulate the conversation. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Another great question here uh, from uh, Isaac or Isaac. Um, where do you look to cut weight and where is the weight worth it? around the stomach yeah. you know like mostly <laughs> that's where it's worth it <laughs> i i want to say one quick little piece it's uh it's on skins um i really don't believe in high traction skins i like a skin that is uh i'm sorry Nate, this is so ski specific but i like something that has a good glide to it a good slide i prefer a skin track that's a little bit less aggressive and more of a slide um but and, and like a lightweight sort of skin Awesome. I think one way, one really good way to save weight is to have group gear, like that toboggan that I was talking about. Like, not everybody needs a toboggan. Not everybody needs a first aid kit. Like, to have have that conversation in the morning and spread that out, and that way you you will all have the right the right uh, kit instead of everybody just having like one crappy little first aid kit. Like, bring one good first aid kit and one good toboggan, and like that instead of like trying to pare everything down, I think. Makes a lot of sense. I've got another question here from Nathan. He's asking, uh, are there any backcountry navigation apps uh, that are your favorite and that work offline? I so I, mean, I think he's thinking uh, your, your, your um, free mobile phone, your smartphone, smartphone apps. I think we're all pretty much on Gaia these days. For as far Anything as map else? programs go, as long as you download them before before that, but they, mm -hmm. I mean, those new maps are incredible. I think that's the key, hey, is making sure that that uh, the imagery is actually cached on your device, hey, so that it's it's not having to try to download it when you're out in the field somewhere. Yeah. Anyone else? Hey Nadine, is do this, does the Revelstoke Ski Club or Snowmobile Club have a specific app for like Boulder and whatnot? Let's me double check. Um, it. No. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm cutting in and out. So if you lose me, I apologize. Okay. No, I don't think they do. But ones that I use, I also use trail forks in the winter because it does cache oh, it cool. in there. And I find like if you're kind of in a spot where you need to know what's below you, um, you can pull up the topo and or the satellite imagery if you've had it up before. Uh, it works pretty good. And Avenza is another really good one too. Um, but you have to pre-download your maps on that too. But it works the same as Gaia. Cool. And since you got cut off earlier, Nadine, were there any like closing thoughts or like big picture ideas you wanted to make sure that you got across to folks in your presentation? That's a question from me. I'm a
Yeah, no, I, I'm afraid because I'm having like connection issues here. But uh, as far as like wait, like waiting up on the sledding world, I try to pack all my water in my tunnel bag if I can, because I find that weighs a lot. So it is one thing that if you can make a fire, you can make water as well later if you lose your sled for some reason. Um, yeah, try and pack all that stuff on your tunnel. It's kind of handy having a sled. It's a different <laughs> game when you're just ski touring. My backpack changes quite a bit when I go into split boarding mode, but. What, what, what kind of a backpack do you, do you have? What, what size is it? Um, yeah, and that one, I, you're wrong. I always bear, I have a 40 liter um, for my guide pack on personal days if we're just snowmobiling. I will put most of my my tunnel and have just a survival and rest gear on my back. Um, but I'm four years because I can cinch it down. Um, I like to have everything I'm going to need with me. I'm my sled in where I'm not. So. No, we're kind of losing Diener there, unfortunately. We got some of it. Um, <laughs> heard most of what she was saying. So I've got one more question I can throw out to folks. Um, oh, yeah. for maps, the, the Snowmobile Club actually does use Boone Maps as well. Yeah. So you can a pretty slick app for if you're out there sledding. And that, that's a research that's just growing in our community as well. Awesome. Cool. I'm a big fat map user too. I love the imagery on that one. The 3D imagery is amazing. And honestly, uh, all of us, we use Google Earth, right? You guys, like yeah. our pre-trip planning is like, I've spent totally. so much time Google Earth thing. I know I've done it with Grant and Chris. We've sent so many things. It's like it's such a huge part of the, the pre-trip planning. I've got a, a special question straight for Grant. Uh, what was the name of the item that you bought to make fire? Oh, um, if you go to Valhalla, here and just ask them for fire starter it comes with like i don't remember the name of it it's like fire brick there's probably many different companies there's like it's like sawdust and wax and this seems to last a long time it's worth my five bucks mm -hmm. per year sweet and one last question um on the technical side justin asks or just mentions that it might be worth discussing phones digital radios and interference with transceivers any rules of thumb that you guys would recommend they don't mix, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Rubens, honestly, you, you've been you've been preaching a lot that you know their, their cell phone is turning into one of the essential pieces. So that's not to capture the photos for Instagram. Of course, that's a, a byproduct of it. But having your cell phone charged and ready for the full day and warm is a big piece. But with that, the cell phone acts as a huge digital interference for all transceivers. So you guys know this, but keep all digital interferences at least 20 to 30 centimeters away from your transceiver. So that's cell phones, that's radios, that's even just metal pieces. Set that transceiver up for success. But honestly, you guys, when it's the search, when you are practicing your search, and I really want you guys to practice with your normal kit. So when you're searching, make sure that transceiver is at least 50 centimeters away from a transceiver. So, you know, all of us, we pop our cell phones onto airplane mode, which can still use the, um, the map functions, but uh, the cell phone is a huge piece for the navigational um, and backup system. Yeah, and I, I think like the big part of that is like, is that it comes down to your clothing actually, um, is having like a good uh, suit and especially pants specific. I, I think a lot, a lot of backcountry users are wearing bibs these days. Um, where you can get that separation and like really think about that before you go in the field if you have if you have your phone which which is like you're going to bring like making sure you like that's your pocket your phone and this is where my beacon goes like it, it's like having that system and and then when if something goes wrong you know exactly where to look for you Absolutely. I probably would have cut it off there if Jared hadn't asked this awesome question. He he says, are there any good backcountry clubs where you can find buddies to go out with? Uh, some good kind of rules or some thoughts around <laughs> uh, sourcing uh, backcountry partners from various corners of uh, the, the uh, province or the interweb and things like that. I, I think like most, like if, if you're in Ravi, uh, the Facebook, the Revelstoke uh, ski tours is super active. Like people are posting on their tons. Um, and I think that's like becoming increasingly common wherever you are. Those Facebook groups are like really, really active. And 
Um, people are super into it and you see people asking all the time. Um, but I think another really great way is to take a course or something um, and you'll meet a lot of like-minded people that are kind of in the same kind of area, you know, like uh, if you're like more advanced, like if you're looking at your level ones and stuff like that, then you can, you're going to like match up with people that you are like, you have the same skill set. Or if you're just in your AST one, then it's the same. So the, those courses are really good for not only learning, but fostering uh, backcountry relationships. Yeah, absolutely. You know, those it would be a really good idea if we could start an app called Skinder, but, but it just doesn't exist. <laughs> we, we talked about it, though. I think you might have just blown it. <laughs> Pat, you're about to say something. Cut you off. Uh, just the, the the opportunity, if you know, if you've taken the courses and you've been in the game for a while, doing one of the um, managing avalanche train refreshers or companion rescue refresher. Um, Gosh, I think like the charitable case study is a really interesting one. That deep burial that happened a couple of years back, mm -hmm. you know, is that Banff too? Really deep burial. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I like Louise. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Those folks had just taken a companion rescue course together they, and they were dialed, which is what saved their friends. So yeah, if you're, if you're somewhere between that thing where you're like taking an AST course a while ago, you don't want to go be a professional snow dork. That's a great way to go meet people out there by being like, hey, I care about this stuff. I'm trying to stay dialed and proficient. I'm, I'm, I'm brushing up my skills. That'd be a great place to meet people that I want to ski with. That's awesome. Cool. Well, I think we've got some uh, closing comments from uh, Marty here, and then we'll probably wrap things up. I don't have any hands raised or the questions have kind of thinned out. Let's take it away, Marty. Yeah, I just want to iterate what I was saying earlier. You guys, we've all been there before. We've all seeked mentors. Um, I think all of us in this room um, definitely are here to answer questions. But a couple of things to leave you with. The Avalanche Canada has been leaving amazing bulletins. But also use social media to find, like, see what Rubens is doing. See what Nadine's up to. And then hit them up on questions. So they'll definitely be there. I'm not going to say they're going to answer all of them, but that is a great resource to see what they're up to and whatnot. And Avalanche Canada Instagram has been doing awesome. Um, I'm really excited to say that, um, you know, there's, like I was saying, there's a lot of resources, or sorry, a lot of local companies that run Avalanche courses. But tonight, we are actually going to give away an AST level one from Revelstoke Mountain Resort. Um, this is the big prize. This is the big one. The fact that you guys have lasted this long tonight means you have a chance of winning an ast1 but definitely especially in revelstoke you guys with restrictions and everything there are companies that are heading out but rmr is giving one away tonight nancy i think you're still on who is the lucky winner for an ast1 course from rmr i am on and the winner of an ast1 course is andrea bass andrea bass you can contact us at producer at avalanche.ca and we will set you up with your prize. Well done, thanks. We're all cheering for you right now. Like the crowd's going crazy. <laughs> yeah, the crowd's going nuts. <laughs> oh, whatever, 400 people of them. That is a wicked prize. Thanks, RMR. And um, yeah, Colin, I'll let you take it. But you guys, thanks so much for tuning in. This was awesome. I can't believe we're able to do this. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. As you can see, Revelstoke is full of endless possibilities for fun and adventure, and we want everybody returning home safely each day. So go ahead, take the plunge, get training, go out with partners who have experience and who can share their knowledge, but take it slow. The winter's long and full of promise. Learn as much as you can along the way from folks like these. Also, we want to send a huge shout out to all the retailers and businesses in town who are engaged in winter recreation. Support these local businesses. They need you. This year, more than ever, we need to help each other um, to make it through this winter. The bottom line is though, stay safe. So check out the Party for Powder silent auction to help raise money for Avalanche Canada as well. There are great uh, draw, uh, prize draws as well and the link is in the chat box. So once again, from everybody here, thanks for joining us and we hope to see you out in the hills. can't leave with a joke. I've got nothing good to say. <laughs>
was 1967 in the streets of California, yay. Kids were growing up too fast, for war was hard to play. Two years too young to pay my dues. I'm walking around town in my denim blues. Well, protesters marching, singing songs of love and peace. Uncle Sam, bring our boys home, would you pretty please? The streets were flooded. 